Hello and welcome to Derby, the most haunted city in England. My name's Richard Felix and what I want to do first of all is to try and explain to you why Derby really is ghost capital of England, the dead centre of England. Over the last 2,000 years and before, Derby has been a crossing of the ways. From prehistoric times, when man laid down ley lines, which later became trackways and roads, they all tended to centre here, on Derby. That means that this place has become a hotbed of psychic energy and power. There is also a phenomenal amount of water underneath the centre of Derby, earth energy. The River Derwent goes through the centre, and at least seven brooks converge underneath the city centre here at Derby. From the time of the Vikings, Derby was also the Assize Town. So any crime committed in Derbyshire, if you were caught, you ended up being brought to Derby. We had five different jails here in the centre of Derby. So you were tried here, you were imprisoned here, and of course you were executed here. We had here in Derby in 1817, the last sentence of hanging, drawing and quartering to take place in provincial England. We had the only peer of the realm ever to be hanged for murder. We had Derbyshire's only female martyr burnt at the stake here in Derby. We had witch trials in Derby and executions. And in 917, we had the Battle of Derby. A ferocious battle fought within the streets within the gates of Derby. So there has been much terror, torment, anguish, pain, and of course death, that has centered on this old historic town, which later became a city. So what better place to start this video than here in the center of Derby in St. Peter's churchyard. Here for many, many years, executed people were buried in this graveyard. And in 1349, when the Black Death came to Derby, of the 3,000 population of the town, a third perished from the Black Death. St. Peter's was the most densely populated part of the town. And so, of course, when they came to burying their victims here, in this graveyard, they realized they were going to have an overcrowding problem. So they resorted to burying the victims here, in this graveyard, vertically. They're known to this day as the vertical graves of St. Peter's. And of course there are many ghost stories attached to this graveyard. A white lady wanders around the graveyard. People hear moans and cries. They hear screams. And at the back of me here, in this very, very old pub called Ryan's, there is a lot of poltergeist activity. Glasses blow up of their own accord, chairs move on their own, and people often say that when they're looking out of one of the windows into the churchyard, they see a dark, shadowy figure wandering around this graveyard. So there are many, many more stories for me to tell you of this ancient, haunted city of Derby. So settle back, turn down the lights. Give me your full attention and let me take you on a tour of Derby, the most haunted city in England. And I'm on Friargate, outside the aptly named Scream, which is a student club. This was originally, from 1230, a Dominican friary, hence the name Friar Gate. But when the monasteries were dissolved in the 1530s, this became redundant, was eventually knocked down, and a huge 48 bedroom Georgian mansion built here in 1725. But it's got rather small cellars for a building this size. There's a very good reason for that. When they were digging the foundations, they started unearthing things, bones, skulls, lumps of wood from coffins. They stopped work and consulted old plans and found that they were actually digging here on this site in an area marked Ye Friars Graveyard. So they sealed that part off 
and they never excavated any further, which is why this building is so haunted. They obviously disturbed things under the ground. The cellars are very haunted, some of the rooms are haunted, and the area around the bar is also haunted by figures of friars that still come back to see what's happened to their beloved friary. So we'll go inside and I'll tell you a few stories of the haunted friary hotel. And I'm now entering what I believe to be one of the best preserved Georgian buildings in the centre of Derby, complete with its 18th century panelling. Unfortunately, the bar has changed quite a lot, but it was here um, many, many years ago in the 50s, a gentleman called David, who was the under manager of the Friary Hotel. It was a Friday night and he was sitting here with five other men on bar stools at the bar. All of a sudden, the temperature dropped and each man was pushed like dominoes, one onto the other. Beer went everywhere. The last man actually fell off because he got nobody to fall against and actually broke his elbow. They then noticed going away from them down here what he described as a monk wearing a black hood and a black cloak and it disappeared through the oak panelling at the end of the room. Now, either David was a good historian, a liar, or he actually saw it because he saw a monk, which in fact was a friar, wearing a black cloak and a black hood. These were Dominican friars here, the only ones in Derby, and guess what? They wore black. They were known as the Black Friars. And now we're coming downstairs into the cellars underneath the friary. This is probably the most evil part of the whole place. The things that go on down here you just would not believe. And this corridor along here is actually part of the original friary going back to 1230. These walls are original. Up here, just, you can actually see one of the original mullion windows of the old friary with the centerpiece there and the old original bars on it. And then continuing down here, very low, it's not too bad to be honest with you because obviously the lights are on, but in the dark this place is not at all nice. And on here to the very end, this is as far as the cellars go and through there is where the bodies are. We're now down amongst the dead men. And this is the part where they were digging out in 1725. And the bodies, bits of coffin started to fall out. So they sealed it off and left it. And the number of things that are now happening to people actually on the ghost walk. Only a few weeks ago, we had two ladies pushed over here in this room and lights similar to will-o'-the-wisps, green lights, different coloured lights actually appearing when we switch the lights out in here. And although we've always said that ghosts don't appear to audiences, it's surprising how many things happen here in this part of the cellar. But just next door to us, through here, not that long ago, when they were renovating it for bass, in this very room here, a workman, an electrician, was alone down here with his torch, feeding wires through from one side of the building through to the other, through holes in the wall. And he noticed or sensed that there was something in here with him. But as you do, you just sort of carry on working. He didn't really think it was anything to fear. And he eventually turned round and looked. And standing in the corner here in this room was the figure of a friar wearing a black hood no face as usual and of course the man just lost it dropped his tools and ran he didn't come back he actually had to be moved to another site in nottingham he would not dare come back here at all and his mates had to come down collect his tools 
his torch, which of course the battery had run out by then, and he never ever dared to come down here again. So, to be honest with you, this is probably the scariest part of the whole building. But then again, there is more. There's room 106, the haunted bedroom. I'd better take you up there and let you have a look. On the way out of the cellars, before we reach room 106, I must tell you the story of a gentleman who was a waiter at the Lady in Grey in Chardlow, a very haunted building. Never saw a ghost all the time he was there, but within a fortnight of being here at the Friary, he was walking down this corridor. He'd been helping the cellarman to roll barrels from one end to the other. It was daytime, Wednesday afternoon, lights were on. The cellarman had gone and he went back to switch the lights off. He was walking down this corridor. All of a sudden, coming towards him, was the figure of, as he described, a monk, obviously a friar. Gliding across the floor, no face, came closer and closer to him. He just froze. Just before it got to him, it turned, veered off through the wall and vanished. And he ran. He never touched the stairs. He worked for them for three years and he told me that in the whole time he was in the building, he never ever would venture down here alone. This is the haunted wardrobe in the haunted bedroom number 106 and it was actually here in 1850 that the son of the mayor of Derby actually shot himself. This was his bedroom and his ghost of course still haunts this to this day. Now a marvellous story to do with the wardrobe and the room. Um, many years ago when this was a hotel a businessman was staying here and he returned about three o'clock in the afternoon just to freshen himself up and as he walked in the room he found all of his clothes out of the wardrobe lying on the bed. He didn't think anything was spooky about it, he just went downstairs to reception and complained and they said to him oh yeah what, what room are you in sir? He said 106 and they said oh yes um, perhaps we could move you to another room perhaps an upgrade and he said no I'm quite happy but just don't let anybody come in again and move my clothes. Anyway he came back at night went to bed and about half past three in the morning fast asleep both taps came on in his wash basin and at the same moment both wardrobe doors flew open and his clothes came out onto the bed. Next thing he was downstairs, empty suitcase in one hand, his clothes in the other hand. And of course he said, I'll have the bill please. And he left. So this is quite haunted to say the least, but there's actually modern things, things still happen here today. And Sarah and Adia here sat, not on the haunted bed luckily, but on another one. And I mean, Things have actually happened to you in here, haven't they, Adi? Or to both of you, actually? Uh, there is one story of one of the, the girls who does training for all, all members of staff from all over the country. Yeah. Uh, she probably spends three days a week here. This was like six, in here? six years ago. Yeah. Right. So obviously, you're doing a three day training course, so she needs somewhere to stay. Mm. So we've got five or six rooms, and one of the nights, she, obviously asleep in one of these three beds and she woke up in the middle of the night and she saw from the beam a uh, half torso hanging from chains and she still comes to the venue once in a while but she never stays anymore. She always goes home? Well she always checks in differently. Gotcha, gotcha, she won't stay here. Uh, Flipping the door always, always opens by itself as well. Yeah. Uh, we come and check it every day and it's always even though if we locked it the night before, I'm well, not locked it, but closed it. But it's on a proper latch, I presume. It's, it's not yeah. faulty or no. It's always open about a couple of inches, so the taps in the bathroom come on by themselves. Yeah. Even if we turn them off. Flipping it, because that actually happened on most haunted, apparently, yeah. um, didn't it? Yeah. Were you were you here at the time, or did you experience what happened? What were the taps? Mm. Yeah, because we we came up to uh, check the room. Uh, before they came up here, yeah. turn all the lights on for them and lock the door so that nobody could come in. And uh, all the bathroom was fine, taps were fine, everything. You guys had gone, 
came upstairs, turned the lights off and I opened the door and it was absolutely boiling in there and it was just covered in steam and the red, the, the hot tap was all the way on. And yeah, I'd twist it a couple of times because it wasn't like it was just... Not just slightly on. I had to yeah. twist it a couple of times to turn it off. So someone's turned it on and the only person that could have been in here was one of the old spirits that live in here. So. Flipping out. But you've also yeah. done some, some table tilting, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, I did um, a couple of staff like to know all the ghost stories that happened in here. So yeah. I told them about the stories in the room and they wanted to come up and do a seance. So we all came up, there was about six of us and it was after work one night. And we all stood around the table and uh, we asked like a couple of times, is anything here? Could you move something? Could you make a noise? Um, and the table moved and you could hear it pull across the carpet. Like right. That. And um, I thought it was the girl next to me because my leg was touching the back of the table and then it wasn't. So I asked her if she moved it, she said she hadn't. So we carried on doing it and I asked again and the table moved again. So we said, right, to rule out anyone pushing it, we moved the table to right across the other side of the room and we asked it again and the table just went a good way across the floor. So it actually responded yeah. to, to your questions? Mm. But we did, um, a couple of weeks after that we did another one and uh, we, we tried to film it with a night vision camera and we had 90 minutes of battery on the camera and we came in here and after three minutes the battery died straight away but when we look back at the tape, when I was asking the questions of um, is anybody here, could you move the table like you did last time, there was loads of orbs going round the table about 30, wow. 40 orbs going round the table. And you've got that on, on, on actually got on film now, have you? And because the DJ stays up the room, yeah. a couple of doors up, and he's been in bed and he's heard like walking up and down the corridor at night, and mm. he gets himself completely sozzled now when he goes to bed so he doesn't hear anything. And he's a big bloke, and yeah. he's very scared. And we left a camera in the hallway one night, and uh, on, on it you caught loads of orbs, and you heard a bang, and you can hear walking. Wow. So the, the beauty of this place is, of course, things happen to people on the ghost walks down below yeah. in the cellars and this sort of stuff. But the beauty of it is it's, it's active. It's every it, day. That's the thing. It's yeah. not old stories. Yeah. It's all based on the old stories, but things are still happening today. Yeah. And that's something I think quite special. Now, of course, I mean, you, you're obviously now, you're a student club and, and pub restaurant as well. So, I mean, people can come in, obviously day and night and, and, and visit the place. But and if they're in the club, they're actually dancing on graves as well. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, to be honest with you, although they can't come up here, yeah. obviously, they can come in and, and experience the place yeah. and also look for the spirits behind the bar. Oh. Right. Ching, ching. Yeah, Aidy, Sarah, thank <laughs> you very much. This is an undiscovered part of Derby. A lot of people don't know this exists. It's Blacksmith's Yard. And this incredible old Burgess's house is haunted but then again you'd expect something as old as this to be haunted but the strange thing is that it's almost a fake or a dummy this building was actually found in Derby marketplace about 20 years ago and was removed and brought here but the only original part of the building are the actual timbers and parts of the staircase and there is a ghost in here of a lady wearing a Tudor costume. She's been seen on the stairs, she's been seen upstairs, and she's been seen downstairs. But how can a building that wasn't here be haunted? I'm not sure. I believe that the ghost has actually come with the building. And I think it's a recording of some tragic or traumatic event, obviously her death, that for some reason became impregnated into the timbers. A recording. And then every so often when the atmosphere is similar or on the anniversary of her death or something like that, she's seen again. But there are actually folks working in there now, so I'm going to wander inside and um, see if they've got any stories for me. Afternoon, girls. Afternoon. Got any ghosts? Well, I, I know you have, <laughs> but uh, anything ever happened to anybody in here? Or, or? There's been lots of experiences, yeah. Really? Because you do know it's not an old building, don't you? I you, do. Yeah. I wasn't we here before. No, there was nothing okay. here. It's the timbers, I think, that actually cause it. But, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, anybody seen anything? or? We feel a lot of things, and I've, I've experienced various things, but one of them, particularly most of them, are nearly always on the stairs, on the top of the stairs. Yeah. 
Um, I had a frightening experience about 18 months ago, two years ago, when I was interviewing somebody. Um, and we're upstairs in the interview room, so we've got a desk between us. Yeah. And the lady was sitting quite firmly back in her chair. And we have interview notes, just like this, right. application form, where we write information down on the back. That was on the desk. I was. I asked her a question, looked up to the answer, and when I looked back down again, we both looked at the same time, and there was a splodge of blood appeared straight in the middle of the on the on, on the application form, actually on the application form, and straight away we both looked up. There was nothing on the ceiling. So nothing could have dripped out of the ceiling. Nothing could have dripped out of the ceiling. She was sitting too far back for anything to have happened. She hadn't cut herself. She you hadn't, hadn't cut herself. We looked. I felt. I've even felt my nose. <laughs> everything. And wow. Nothing. And we came downstairs and looked at it, and, I, and it was definitely. And I even. I didn't touch it with my finger, but I touched it with the pen, and it moved. It wasn't. It was. Fresh. It was real. Yeah. It was. And it was blood. Wow. Well, it was dread. <laughs> Flipping heck. Yeah. yeah. That was quite frightening. I that, should think yeah, so. It was. Um, oh, I say. Anything else? Anybody else? I mean, consulting feelings at the top of the yeah. stairs. When you stand at the top of the stairs, you very much feel like you're just going to go, and it almost feels like inevitable that you will fall down the stairs. And I have fallen down the stairs once, but whether that's the ghost <laughs> assistance or whether that's just me being clumsy, Crikey. I can't really prove. But that. I mean, you all. So I mean, everybody senses. Yeah, so. I was standing um, near the radiator one day, just just talking to the receptionist, and you think it's somebody coming down the stairs, and out the corner of your eye, it really does look like a shadow or something. And when you look back, there's nobody there. Crikey. Yeah, we always see Do you hear things or just sort of sense, see it and sort of... I don't, I don't think you hear it, no. I've never no. heard anything, no. but you do sense things. But it's always out of the corner of your eye and, and yeah. you think there's someone there. And yeah. Quite, quite there. often, even on the, the hottest of days, or even when we've got the, the central heating on, um, you, particularly from this area, you do feel a cool breeze, almost as if somebody's walked past you and brought up a draft in through the door. Yes. A cool breeze, and, and who it normally goes that way, because whoever sat there normally feels at the same time as I do. Crikey. So really, you've all sent something. Yeah. Answer wow. Answer being switched and on everyone, and off, things disappearing. Yeah. Everyone I know that's worked in this office have all noticed something, have they? I mean, we try. Go, we never want to tell anybody when they first come because you don't want to frighten them. But oh, I can understand yeah, that. They, as soon as they start to go upstairs, they do feel something. We had a banister put on because of the because the, the, the danger up of. To, well, Claire fell down. Yeah. But I, when I'm at the top of the stairs and you come around to go down, there's no way I would even dream of coming down without holding on. It, it is that strong at the top of the yeah. stairs. Flipping sometimes, it. Sometimes, sometimes strong, and sometimes you really have to. You stop and you stand there for a minute holding on because you yeah. really think you're going to go. That's amazing. Sometimes nothing. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, I obviously we don't know, but I mean there is a possibility that someone hundreds of years ago. Uh, fell down the stairs, um, died, tragic, traumatic death, hence the fact that, that it's reenacted, seen again, even though it's a, a comparatively new, because all the walls and everything are all new. Yeah. It's only the timbers and the stairs, yeah. a bit of the stairs that's original. Definitely. But you can also feel sometimes um, when you go up towards the, the kitchen area upstairs, it's, you, I always think somebody's already up there. Yeah, because you can sense people, can't you? That is that is amazing. What about the cleaner when the cleaner came here one night? Oh yeah, and she was she just cleared away some pots as she does. Yeah. Was going upstairs with them at the top of the stairs, and her only explanation she could say to me was that she felt that she hadn't fallen or tripped, but the coffee, what was left, actually spilt out of the cups and went onto the wall. And right. She said, and I didn't know how it had happened. And the time before that, she'd not long started here, <laughs> and a computer switched on. So it's rather active. It is, yeah. That is fantastic. Well, I, I mean, I didn't know whether to pop in and ask or not, but uh, I'm glad I have. Um, I think what we're going to have to do from now on is feature it uh, on the ghost walk. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, girls. That's great. Thank welcome. you very much indeed. Thanks. Cheers. Nice to meet you. And you. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Yeah, See you again. You. Bye. 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 Hello and welcome to Derby Jail. Just hang on one minute while I unlock the doors and then you can come in and see for yourself. Enter, please do. This building that you're entering now is probably one of the most haunted buildings in the whole of Great Britain. But why? 
these are some of the things I'm going to try and explain to you while we're wandering around the jail. I have actually seen a ghost here in this building. It was literally here in this corridor, this long dark corridor which led up to the gallows. It was three and a half years ago on a Friday afternoon, it was daylight. I was standing in the kitchen and I actually saw a figure, a grey hazy figure. I can't tell you whether it was male or female, but it looked like a person. It hovered down this corridor past me. It was above the floor and the amazing thing was that not only did I see it, but I sensed it and it frightened me. And I must be honest with you, I do expect to see it again. But there are many, many other stories to do with this building of which I'm going to tell you and we'll start off in one of the rooms that was known as the day room the room where people went to work the room where people were taken possibly before they were executed just in here this room here bigger than the cells had a fireplace and a large window debtors were put in here and they had to work they couldn't leave this building until they'd actually paid off their debts it was also used I would imagine as a day room for the prisoners because the amazing thing is that even the condemned were allowed out of their cells to wander the corridors possibly come in here to keep warm and also of course their families would come and visit them in a room like this for the last time before their execution a very interesting story in this room uh, two or three years ago a gentleman on the ghost walk emailed us the following morning to tell us that he'd been on the ghost walk with his wife he was sitting here at this table in the corner and when the guide was actually finishing off after they had the meal the guide was standing here under this doorway leaning on this piece of wood and he was telling him that the only way that some of the souls that haunt this place could ever get release was by following people home and he said while he was talking at the back of him there was a figure hanging it seemed to be hanging from the wood above the door and its feet weren't touching the ground. It was wearing either a shawl or a black shroud and it was swaying ever so gently. He went on to ask had anyone else ever seen similar here in this building and they hadn't. But what we did was we sent him a copy of the Penny Dreadful on the wall here telling of the suicide of John and Benjamin Jones, burglars from Ashbourne, who, guess what, hanged themselves from the wood above the door of the condemned cell the night before their execution. The jailer found them hanging and fetched the prison surgeon to bleed them, to revive them, so they could hang them later on that day. But they were dead and they buried them in unconsecrated ground beneath the gallows. Is it, was it, the ghost of one of those two brothers that that gentleman saw hanging from this door? Who knows? But there's lots of other things to see. Um, here, the corridor of the old jail. All that's left of the place, unfortunately, are the basement cells, the dungeons, and the condemned cells. And one or two of the cells still preserved down here with their original doors, the bolts, and the locks still on them and on the back of them graffiti from the prisoners here an incredible message from J Taylor of Meesham for a ten pound debt 1807 strange things happen in here as they do in all of the building but people can't stay in here for long without feeling sick and they get this sense that when they're in here they're not alone but much worse than this cell, the one next door, the condemned cell. We'll go and have a look. Rather dark in here, because you see, you are imprisoned in a room where no light can enter, no window. And the amount of ghostly goings on that take place in here, you just wouldn't believe it. Again, people feeling sick people sensing things in here as if they're not alone and a few months ago uh, we were doing an evening um, ghost hunt here 
and before anyone was even allowed in, there was smoke puttering out of the building. Three fire engines came. They came in here, and the fire was coming from this room, from the condemned cell. There was a large wooden stool here, an oak stool, and for some reason it had caught fire. Oak stools don't do that. The whole of this room was covered in smoke, and even now you can still see how blackened the brickwork is. In fact, even the cobwebs are black. But the strange thing is that this bed here, which of course is an original prison cot from the 1800s, wasn't even scorched. And for some strange reason, it hasn't even turned black. This is the actual prison cot that was featured on Most Haunted when the trigger object, the cross, actually moved on the piece of paper here on this very bed. So, to be quite honest with you, this room, this condemned cell, is the most haunted part of the whole building. The number of seances that have been held in here, the number of table tilting sessions that have been held in here, and you'd be surprised how many times things actually happen to people in here. So this is the place to come if you want to see ghosts, sense ghosts, here, Derby Jail and the old condemned cell. Now this is a real scoop and I also do my own stunts. I'm in the attics, the old original attics of the dolphin and I'm searching for the secret room that was exposed a few years ago and uh, this is extremely old, of course it is, 1530, uh, very rickety and I just hope that I don't actually go through <laughs> through the ceiling. What the hell's happened there? Oh I don't like this. Why is it that when I get in stupid places lights go... This was a new battery this morning um, and this isn't the first time this has happened to me. Um, it's something to do with ghosts and energy. They tend to drain batteries. Um, as long as I don't see anything, I'll be all right. But this is the entrance to what was known as the secret room. No one knew this existed. And a few years ago, they were having a search round up here. And um, here, in the original roof, look at these, these reeds were actually put here in 1530 but this wasn't put there then this is an old Victorian bayonet that was actually found here in this part of the roof when it collapsed this is a murder weapon why did they hide it there is a story one of the many stories of this building of a ghost of a girl that wanders downstairs, walking through the walls. Is she a tormented soul that still haunts because she was murdered here in this building? Was she murdered with this actual bayonet? And was it then hidden in here to hide the evidence? We'll probably never know. And this, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's, is the most eerie, scariest place in the whole of the city of Derby. These are the tunnels underneath Derby's Guildhall. It goes back to at least 1828. And, well, just listen to it. And here it opens out into a labyrinth of tunnels stretching underneath Derby all the way down here and all the way along there are rooms this one completely boarded up bricked up for some reason who's still in there we don't know and down here rooms all the way along all haunted of course and then as all souls and spirits 
want to do, we come towards the light. And this is the farthest extent towards the marketplace, which is just under here. These were last used as air raid shelters during the Second World War. I actually had a lady one night on a ghost walk who said that the last time she was down here was during the war. And she said a lot of these rooms down here were full of cardboard coffins, flat-backed coffins for use if there was a big air raid. But luckily, there wasn't. And then we continue on round here, getting lighter all the time. And then this here is the farthest extent that we actually go, or can go, on the Derby Ghost Walk. But today, I just happen to have the keys. So I'm just going to go through and give you a, a brief glimpse of what you don't normally see. And now, just unlock this door and open up. This is the bit that people on the ghost walks don't see. The continuation of the tunnel. And on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, all the way along, are barrel vaulted rooms. And of course, what about the ghost stories down here? There's the ghost of a little boy called Sammy, who's seen in the cellars of the Royal Bank of Scotland, which is almost next door. He's also seen wandering down here. The number of council workmen years ago that have seen him down here, not thinking it's a ghost, thinking it's a little boy trespassing. They try to get him out, they chase him. And of course, Will of the Wisps always vanished. He's never there. They also often hear ghostly footsteps of both men and women, because just on the right hand side here is the old tunnel that comes from Lockup Yard through here and up to the Guildhall, which used to serve as the magistrates' courts. One lady whose ghost still haunts down here, Alice Wealdon, the pear tree poisoner. She was accused of trying to poison the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. She was set up by MI5, tried at the Old Bailey and imprisoned until the end of the First World War. She was released, lived as a recluse, and is buried in an unmarked grave in Nottingham Road Cemetery. And they say that they often hear the tip-tap of ladies' stiletto heels wandering these tunnels. And it's believed to be the restless soul of Alice Wealdon. This is the notorious Room 29 of the Bell. And through this window, a magnificent view of Old Derby. I just wonder who it was that peered through this window not long before she died in this very room. After this place ceased to be a coaching inn, it became a hotel. And the landlord and his family lived upstairs here. This room was the bedroom of the landlord's son. He was a very bad asthmatic. And in the middle of the night, mum and dad heard the boy out of bed, choking, coughing. Father rushed into the room to find the boy standing in the dark, bent forward, coughing, choking, reaching. Standing over him was a girl, a girl wearing a frilly mob cap, a starched apron, and an 18th century costume. She was actually patting the boy on the back as if to relieve his suffering. As father came in, she did the usual thing vanished, vaporised, and father took over. Thirty years later, a totally different family here, but this time, this was a nursery, and the landlady was changing a baby's nappy in here. All she did was turn away from the baby, I presume, to get either nappy pins or cotton wool. She turned back. She'd been substituted. There was another girl standing over her baby, going to pick it up. It had got a frilly mob cap and starched apron. It was the same girl or the same ghost. Mother actually reached through the ghost and drew the baby through it. She felt neither rush of air or drop in temperature. She clutched the baby to her and ran out of the room. And as she left, she turned back. And the ghost was still standing there, bending over to pick up what was no longer there, her baby. She closed the door 
sealed off the room and changed nurseries. Personally, I think I would have changed inns. But it was in this room when we did a vigil on Most Haunted about two years ago. And I was actually sitting underneath this window here. And I was asking if there was anyone in the room. I was squatting down here and I said, I feel as if I know you. I've stood underneath this window for the last 11 years telling your story. Is there anybody there? Will you make contact with us? And at that moment, there was a loud slam downstairs on the next floor. And the door slammed very, very hard. There was absolutely no possibility that anyone had done it. There was no one else in the building. I'd got the key. There was absolutely no draft. There isn't a possibility at all that it was done by human hands. I genuinely believe that it was a response from the girl that I've told so many stories about that still haunts this room and this building to this day. Now this is a real scoop. We've just finished filming in room 29 and I mentioned the old Tudor bar and the landlady said to me, well, if you want the keys, you can go in and have a look. And of course, guess what? It's haunted. I haven't been in here since about 1968. This was a gentleman's only bar. Wouldn't be allowed today, of course. And it's haunted. Gosh, it's dark. It's now used only as a storeroom, which is a bit of a waste, really. Although it's not old, it was only built actually in 1929, whereas the bell itself goes back to at least 1680. It's got an original old Tudor fireplace here, obviously from another building. And only a few weeks ago, two ladies came into the Heritage Centre to tell us a ghost story about this, the Tudor bar. And one of the lady's daughters was a barmaid here. One night, gentlemen all sat here drinking, and a figure of a lady came through that back wall. She was wearing a big hat and a Victorian dress. She was distinctly grey and transparent. And she walked right through the centre of the building, past all the gentlemen drinking. Many of them actually saw her, as did the barmaid. And she disappeared, not through the door, but actually through that window and vanished. And as she told us, strangely enough, they'd never seen her before, no one ever saw her again. Now, whether it's actually the fact that it's a ghost from this building, I doubt, because as I say, this is not very old. Or whether it's a figure that for some reason wandered through the courtyard, then I really don't know. Perhaps it could well be just the fact that it was created by the spirits behind the bar. We'll never know. This is St. Werberg's Church. Possibly the origins of Saxon Derby lie here, beneath my feet. This was originally a wooden Saxon church dedicated to a Saxon princess, Werberg. But this place I'm in now is actually known as the Johnson Chapel. And on the 12th of July, 1735, Dr. Samuel Johnson was married there, here, on this very spot. But it has some horrid stories to tell as well, because this is the nearest church to Derby Jail in Friargate. And before any execution took place, usually on a Sunday, the condemned were brought in a cart from the jail down here to the church. They had to kneel here in front of an upright, open coffin. The coffin that they'd made in the prison the week before their execution. It's not terribly haunted, I'm pleased to say, but people that have actually visited this place have actually said that they've seen a figure standing to the left here, they said it's a figure of a woman with a long dress. But of course, 
there's a possibility that it could be a man wearing a shroud because all Catholics were actually brought here for the service and then executed already wearing their shrouds. People have taken photographs in here and have seen orbs on them as well. But outside, in a single deep grave, are buried the ringleaders of England's last revolution, the Pentrich revolutionaries, Brandreth, Turner and Ludlam, hanged and beheaded in front of Derby Jail on November the 7th, 1817. They lie somewhere out there without a grave. Perhaps their tormented souls still wander this graveyard even to this day. Somewhere here in this graveyard lie the remains of the ringleaders of England's last revolution, the Pentrich Revolution. They are buried here in a single deep grave with no headstone. Perhaps it's their ghosts that still haunt this graveyard. But there's a, an amusing story to tell. After they were executed in 1817, a barber from Cheapside used to dress up with a sheet over his head and a wig stand to represent a severed head under his arm. This, as it is today, was a public thoroughfare and he used to leap out from behind the gravestones, terrifying the people of Derby. But one night he got his comeuppance because some lads that weren't so terrified picked up some stones and threw them at the ghost. And one of the stones hit the ghost in the face and took out his eye. He was arrested and imprisoned in Derby Jail for disturbing the peace. Nobody's seen him since. Nobody sees ghosts in this graveyard. So perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps those three unfortunate men that were hanged and beheaded here in Derby in 1817 are resting peacefully. Now, this is an extremely interesting story. We're right next door to Derby Jail. And this place here is Hive Recording Studios. And a few years ago, a lady rang me to tell me her son had seen a ghost. And she said, could I give him your phone number and he could contact you? I said, yes, of course. Two days later, the phone went and it was her son telling me of his ghost story here. It was about 10 past 10 on a Sunday night. He was a member of a pop group called the Beekeepers. And he was coming out of this recording studio. He was the key holder, he was the last one out. He came out of this door, closed it, and as he closed it, he heard a loud jangling of keys. He said so loud that it sounded as if he'd still got his headphones on, but of course he hadn't. He thought no more of it, put the keys in his pocket and started to come down here, down this alleyway. Coming towards him was a man, a large man, in a large, what he described as a trench coat tied with a belt. It was coming towards him with intent. He thought he was going to attack him. And as the figure got towards him, he said, I stared it straight in the face and I said to it, are you all right, mate? To try and diffuse the situation. The figure didn't speak. He just continued to look at him as it came towards him. And as he expected to get thumped by the man, nothing happened. It went straight through his right shoulder without him feeling anything, continued up the alleyway until it got halfway to where this tall building is and there was a loud clang as if a metal door had closed and the figure vanished. He slumped down in a heap by the wall and he was sitting there shaking and then he saw a lady standing at the bottom of the road here, an elderly lady. She came up to him and said, are you all right? I saw that man attack you. And he said, he didn't, he never touched me. And lo and behold, she helped him up and the two of them went through into the car park to see where the man had gone. He'd vanished. He said, she stayed with me for about 10 minutes. And then I went home, poured myself a very stiff whiskey. And that's how you know the story, because I told my mum and she came and told you. Now, no one else has ever reported seeing a ghost here since. There's nothing been reported before, but what it is, why it was seen by that young lad, 
on that night in October, I've no idea. Whether these were once cottages belonging to the jail, whether that's the significance with the keys and the slamming of a metal door, I've no idea. What I can't do is prove these ghost stories. I can't make this ghost appear in front of you now. All I can do is relate to you stories I've been told, and then it's up to you to make up your own minds whether there really are ghosts. But I know full well after the, the years of, of talking and interviewing people, I know people see ghosts. I know that people that report them aren't all nutcases with a vivid imagination that are overtired or have had too much to drink. People do see ghosts. This is Vernon Gate. This was the third county jail built at Derby in 1828 and was the most modern prison in England. Executions took place here from 1833, either from the top of the gatehouse or here in front of this window. And the gallows was built up to the lip here. The door opened and it stretched out 17 feet here to where this car is now. All the condemned stepped out onto the gallows here and in 1872 Dick Thorley, who'd cut his girlfriend's throat in Agard Street, stepped onto the gallows. He was hanged by William Calcraft, the longest serving hangman in British history. He spent 45 years executing people. Thorley stood on the trapdoor, the white cap was pulled over his face, the noose was adjusted, and then Calcraft pulled the lever and launched him into eternity. After hanging here for the customary hour, he was carried back through that aperture, a plaster cast made of his face, a death mask, and then he was taken through and buried in a lime pit in the graveyard. And his ghost still haunts this place to this day. Let's go through and have a look where the graveyard once was. This is where the graveyard was. Up against the wall, they're all buried at right angles. Thorley, along with many other people, all condemned to death, all hanged here, and a few suicides were buried under my feet. And Thorley's ghost is often seen wandering along this little passageway, wearing a white cap over his face with a rope around his neck. How people know it's Thorley, I don't know, when he's covered over. But I presume it's just the fact that the ghost of someone that was hanged here definitely still walks down here. And of course, Thorley being the most famous person, because here in 1862, 20,000 people turned up to watch Derbyshire's last public execution. I'm standing on um, a bridge over the Mark Eaton Brook, almost in the centre of Derby. This is the brook that actually runs right through the centre of Derby. And of course I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't haunted. This was a very poor part of Derby, it was Derby's West End. And um, well, if you could just imagine the number of unwanted babies that were actually thrown discarded, um, drowned here in, in, in the brook and of course floated down through, through the centre of Derby and were washed up in various places. Um, one unfortunate lady who actually became pregnant lived um, on the banks of the brook here, in a place called Brook Street, and um, she was not allowed to have children in her bed sit. The landlady heard crying and fetched a constable. This was in 1822. Uh, they broke in and uh, asked where the baby was and she said, there was no baby here. So they searched and underneath the bed covers, under the bed, was a large jug with a muslin cover on top of it. In the jug was a badly scolded newborn baby. It died three days later. That girl was arrested 
and sentenced to hang. Her name was Hannah Haley and she was the last woman to be hanged in Derby. Her ghost wanders around the area of the brook here and she is one of the many reported sightings of ghosts that's seen in Derby Jail. But behind me here, student accommodation for Derby University. But in 1862, this was the scene of a horrendous murder. The murder of a lady called Eliza Morrow. She had a throat cut in court number four at the back of these buildings. She was murdered by her boyfriend, Dick Thorley. She was two-timing him, and one day in April 1862, he came to visit her at the house, knocked on the door, she came out and started slugging him off. He'd got a cutthroat razor in his pocket. He took it out and slashed her across the throat. She collapsed on the floor, bleeding profusely from the large gash across her throat. He threw down the razor and ran off. He was later arrested and hanged for murder. 20,000 people turned up to watch Derbyshire's last public execution. Eliza wasn't dead though when he ran off and they carried her into the house, laid her on the sofa and she died in the arms of a doctor who was trying to stem the flow of blood. And her ghost still haunts this area to this day. They knocked down her house and built a large hosiery mill called Longdon's Mill and over the last 13 years of doing ghost walks around the city of Derby, I must have spoken to at least 20 ladies who actually saw the ghost of Eliza Morrow. But now on the site stands student accommodation. People often ask, do they see anything? And I say, depends what they've been smoking really. But no, you'd be surprised the number of people that actually see ghosts in that building. And in fact, before freshers come in at the beginning of a year, the staff, the cleaners, have to search blocks four and five looking for letters from the old students to the new. And I actually spoke to one lady who used to be a cleaner there and she said one of the letters, and we have to destroy them all because we don't want to let the students know, actually said, Derby, great place, nightlife fantastic, P.S. My room's haunted.